Well, this morning we are going to return to uh, one more lesson on leadership specifically. Uh, last week, Kyle, if you were here, then you heard Kyle open up God's word from the book of Luke and talk about stewardship principles that are so necessary to leading well. And the week prior, uh, we looked at leadership lessons from the lives of two kings, actually one, the, the first of those was King Hezekiah, and we saw 10 principles just driving his godly leadership. This morning, we're going to see a contrary example, a negative example of leadership in King Saul. So go ahead, if you would, just open your Bibles first to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. And just before we jump into Saul's life in particular, just want to get our eyes on this biblical principle dealing with a specific kind of fear, a specific manifestation of fear. And Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says this, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in Yahweh is safe. That's how the ESV reads. If you're reading the New American Standard or maybe the Legacy Standard Bible, it says, trembling before man brings a snare, but he who trusts in Yahweh will be set securely on high. The idea there is the fear or trembling being this quaking idea, uh, having such a regard for the person in view that it produces a trembling. There's a fear of man, and it says that this fear of man brings a snare, brings a snare. It lays an entrapment for your feet, as it were. Same word is used in other portions of scripture to talk about uh, a trap laid for animals, birds perhaps, uh, to entrap them, to sn ensnare them. And just opposite to that first line that the fear of man brings or lays a snare, we have the contrast, but he who trusts in Yahweh is safe or is set securely on high. And that word, uh, really same thing being said there, the, the idea uh, encompasses both, that the safety comes from being exalted or being set high. So the person who is set high up avoids the danger down below. Uh, a similar word is used of a fortress, for example, in Psalm 46, that God is our fortress. Uh, that is that same idea that he is the exalted one in whom we are safe. And so to be set securely on high, to be safe, the only thing that can bring this kind of safety from the fearful things that dwell all around us that are happening every day in our world or even the things that happen and the temptations we experience in our own heart is a firm trust in Yahweh. That's why those two things in this passage are contrasted with each other. One who fears man in opposition or contrasted with one who trusts Yahweh. Saul is going to be a helpful example for us this morning to talk about leadership, specifically ungodly leadership, or an example of leadership in which we see how fear affects leaders. Fear affects your ability to lead. Those uh, over whom you've been given some degree of God-ordained authority, you cannot effectively exercise that leadership, that God-ordained authority, so long as you are practicing ungodly fear. The two are mutually exclusive. They cannot go together. We can learn a lot from Saul's life, uh, not all bad lessons either. Some things, uh, there are some brief and few shining moments in 
what we learn about Saul from the scriptures. But as you follow the biblical writer's articulation of the events that happened in Saul's life, one characteristic about him seems to be prominent, and that character quality is fear. He is perpetually afraid of something. He's a man who's perpetually fearful, dominated by it, it seems. Uh, Before he's made king, he's fearful. And after he becomes king, he's fearful. He's fearful of the people he leads. He's fearful of family. He's fearful of fulfilling his duties. As king, he even fears David, the man who most promoted his success as king. Why would a leader fear someone who's promoting his success, who's ensuring his success. Saul Saul is a man who will teach you those lessons. And we're going to learn this morning uh, specifically four lessons. We're going to look at four events from the life of King Saul. And so the outline for this morning, the impact of ungodly fear on leadership as seen in four events from the life of King Saul. The impact of ungodly fear on leadership as seen in four events from the life of King Saul. Fear, as we'll see, will ruin your ability to lead and impact others in a godly way. In other words, you can't lead well so long as you are fearful. There's probably a whole set of implications and lessons to be learned as those who are Uh, most of our life is following, not leading, right? Even those in authority have to follow uh, certain procedures, certain other people in something. And so there's a whole nother set of lessons that we could learn just as those who are so often in the position of followers. Perhaps that'll be for another time. But this morning, what we're going to learn is that if we fear anything but God himself, then our leadership will be hindered. And before I jump into to 1 Samuel, you can turn there. 1 Samuel chapter 8 is where we'll begin to look at the life of Saul. But before we do jump in, I want to just recommend one resource to you that is perhaps the best, uh, just my favorite even, resource on shepherding your heart away from ungodly fear. And that is John Flavel's book, Keeping the Heart. Keeping the Heart. In Keeping the Heart, there's about 10 pages, a 10-page section, where he goes through 14 rules, he calls them, for how to keep your heart from ungodly fear. And all it is is a set of principles, uh, things to think about, consider, meditate on that will steady your heart in the face of the temptation to fear. Um, If those aren't at the book table yet, because I talked to uh, Jacob and Greg earlier this week, we should be getting those in soon. Um, And if I know some of us have the, the works of John Flavel, If you've got those works, then you can find it in volume five, A Saint Indeed, uh, or also under the title, The Great Work of a Christian Explained and Applied. So Christian Focus has helpfully taken that single work, that single uh, section from John Flavel's works and put it into a, a small booklet called Keeping the Heart. That would be an excellent resource for you to read. So this morning, as we look at the um, impact of ungodly fear on leadership in these four events from King Saul's life, we want to just start first with the first event, Saul's coronation. Saul's coronation, when he is finally made king. And to understand the impact or the significance of that event, which doesn't come until 1 Samuel chapter 10, just look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, when the people actually demand of Samuel, a king. First Samuel chapter eight, I'll be reading chunks of scripture just so we can get the context of each of these events and, and then commenting on them as we go through. Look at verse four, first Samuel eight. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. 
And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. But the thing was evil in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to Yahweh. Then Yahweh said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So this is the dilemma. Israel finds itself with unfaithful leaders. Samuel's been faithful, but Samuel's sons coming up behind Samuel to take over when Samuel's gone, they have not been faithful. And clearly they do not walk in the same way that Samuel does. They do not fear the Lord. And so here the people are demanding of Samuel a king, someone who is an earthly ruler to mediate for them between God and and for them on God's behalf. The sin of the people was not seeking a human to mediate for them between God. They'd had that forever, right? Between, from Moses on, someone was speaking on behalf of God to the people and on behalf of the people to God. The issue here you see in verse five is that they want to be like all the nations, they say. Appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. And this very moment in Israel's history was anticipated in the Torah by Moses in in Deuteronomy chapter 17. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14, Moses writing long before Samuel or Saul or when the people demanded a king, he wrote this, when you enter the land which Yahweh your God gives you and you possess it and live in it and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me. And then he tells them what they can and can't do when they appoint a king. So Moses, as a prophet of the Lord, in prophetic fashion, just says, when this day comes, you're going to get in the land. And when you finally demand for a king, to be set over you. And you'll notice the similarity in that passage, like all the nations who are around me. God beforehand discerns the motives of the nation's heart and says, you're going to want to be like the other nations. And it's out of that desire to be like everybody else around you that you're going to demand a king. Notice they want a king to judge them according to 1 Samuel 8, 5. Verse six, the thing is evil when they said, give us a king to judge us. Again, judgment is in mind, is in view. And just notice if you skip on down to verse 19, nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. Samuel's warned them of what a king's going to be like. This is their last attempt attempt to say, you know what? Let's reconsider. Maybe we don't need that kind of king. But in verse 19, they insist and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. You remember how they went to battle before the Ark of the the Covenant was carried with them and they would experience the success that they did in battle? They don't want that. They want a person at the front, a man, a king, a ruler, someone who is impressive. Like when they go to battle and they see the impressive generals, kings at the front of their battle lines, that's what they want to be like. You'll notice uh, just backing up again, God in verse seven said, told to Samuel, They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me from being king over them. This is what this was, a rejection of God's kingship and demanding a king like the other nations. They didn't have a king like the other nations. 
They had an invisible king, an unapproachable king. They don't want that. The worst thing that you can, you can have, uh, that we can have with our sinful desires <laughs> is for God to actually grant them. And God here grants the request. He says, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. And so he's going to give them what their perverted hearts want, a king. Saul is just that man. In chapter 10, we find him finally becoming king. We don't have time to read all of what's between 8 and 10, but it's kind of comical. He's sent to search for his father's donkey, and he can't find the father's donkey. He's like this lost straggler. He's ready to go back home empty-handed, can't even find his father's donkey. You just imagine Saul roaming the Judean hillsides looking for his donkey, his father's donkey, can't find them. He's so clueless, his slave, his servant, has to say, hey, isn't there a prophet here? Oh, yeah, Samuel. He's famous, and you won't even think to go to him. Well, he's anointed king. Just look at chapter 10, verse 1. Without the servant there, Samuel took the flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him, and said, Has not Yahweh anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? So this is Saul's first time learning that he is the king of Israel, this future king that the nation has recently demanded, you're the guy, you're the man. He sends him away. Verse 17, calls the people together to Yahweh at Mizpah. And he said to the sons of Israel, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But you have today rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses. Yet you have said no, but set a king over us. So now take your stand before Yahweh by your tribes and by your clans. Thus Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near And the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Samuel could have just said, he's the guy, he's it. But by going through this process, bringing all the tribes together, he's ensuring that people are present. This is a public display of who the king is. And by casting lots, the lot is going to fall. This chance activity, quote unquote, Proverbs 16.33 says that all, every decision is determined by God, by Yahweh, in the casting of the lot. So it's going to be beyond doubt that this is God selecting his king, not just Samuel handpicking someone. This is God's anointed one. Verse 21, then he brought the tribe of Benjamin nearby his families, and the Matrite family was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. But... They looked for him, and he could not be found. This is the moment. Where's our king? We're going to celebrate what we've finally been asking for. And he's a no-show. So what do they have to do? They have to consult omniscience to find him. Verse 22, therefore they inquired further of Yahweh, has the man come here yet? So Yahweh said, behold, he's hiding himself by the baggage. So they ran and took him from there, and he stood among the people, and he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Supposed to be an imposing, impressive figure. No one else stands, the height of everyone else is below Saul's shoulders. So you just imagine, if you can just imagine for a second, the tallest man in Israel, supposed to be king, supposed to be celebrated, and where is he? He's with the luggage, hiding. 
what's happening here? What's the fear that we need to take note of? Well, this is a fear of responsibility, or you could call it a fear of authority. That's what he's afraid of. He didn't even tell his family when he got back home that Samuel had anointed him and that he was going to be the king. So evidently, when his whole family goes with the rest of his tribe and all the other tribes of Israel, everybody's clueless except Saul. And what does he do as the only one with this knowledge? He goes and just notice he hid himself. This was not anybody else's idea. He did it. He hid himself because he's too afraid to take reign and take leadership of the nation. This is a sad day. I mean, they, they, they have to shout in verse 24, long live the king. This is a rocky start. But he's afraid of authority. This kind of fear, being afraid of responsibility, being afraid of authority will ruin your ability to lead. Men, if you are afraid of the God-ordained authority that you have by virtue of having asked that woman to marry you, if you're afraid of that, you will not be able to lead her. And then parents who lead children, dad and mom, if you're afraid of the authority, if you don't embrace that authority that he's given you as a parent that you have while your children are under your care, you will not be able to effectively lead them. Just consider what, what uh, Saul is doing here when he's hiding, uh, trying to avoid the authority that God has chosen for him. The, the man is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Not the man should be the head of the wife. No, he is by virtue of being a husband. So you have authority. You might think, I don't, I don't necessarily want that level of res- responsibility. Or as a parent, I don't really want that kind of responsibility that comes with parenting. Too bad. You have it. You can embrace it and lead the way God has said we should, or you can continue in fear of having that authority and just be paralyzed from actually taking care of your duties as a husband, as a spouse, as a parent. This is what Saul is doing here. Just contrast that for a moment with what we learned about Hezekiah from 2 Chronicles 29 last time. This young 25-year-old man is given the crown and he gets after it. He doesn't look around and ask for permission. He's been ordained the king or made the king by God. And so as soon as he is appointed, he gets to it and he starts setting things right because he knows what God has said he should be doing. That even is is another lesson for us. If you're in a leadership position, then you need to know from the scriptures clearly what you should be doing. If you lack clarity, then that would be a cause for fear. Perhaps if you're trying to diagnose why you haven't embraced the kind of responsibility you've been given by God, just ask yourself, consider, do I have clarity about what, what I'm supposed to be doing in this leadership position? Do I know what God has for me as a, as a mom? Do I know what he says I should be doing as a mom, as a dad, as a husband, as a pastor, as a deacon? Just think about the way that uh, avoiding this kind of responsibility works itself out in parenting. You've been given souls entrusted to your care and your children. And from every page of scripture that talks about parenting, that has any implications for parents, any lessons to learn about how to raise up children in your home under your care, authority is a part of the instruction. Children, time and time again, have the singular command by God, obey and honor your parents. That's it. 
That's, that's their single job in life. And so parents who are supposed to be teaching them that, in all kinds of ways, we can seek to avoid that responsibility. You know what this is like if you're a parent, right? And when you should be uh, giving a command and instructing your children, saying, son or daughter, do X, Y, Z, what do we do? We find ways to soften the, the command and abdicate our authority by saying, hey, let's do such and such. As if I'm going to do it too, just come along. Let's, let's stop doing that. Let's not jump on that. Let's put that down. Let's go to bed, right? It's, it's a, it sounds like a suggestion. Instead of saying, well, no, actually, I'm not going to bed yet, but you are. Go get ready for bed, son. <laughs> That's not unkind, right? That's not harsh to give a command. If it's for their good and the good of the home, command them, instruct them, teach them. Other ways we, we, we find a way to avoid the authority we've been given as parents. You know, discipline is just a part of child rearing, especially when they're young. That happens hopefully less and less as they get older, it should. But instead of discipline, what do we do? We avoid responsibility by just, just telling them one more time. And, this, and just one more time. Well, I'm not going to discipline, but I'm going to tell them again. And before you know it, you're angry because what you should have done the first time was discipline them and you wouldn't have had to repeat yourself. Leaders, godly leaders, do not seek to avoid the authority they've been given by God. They also don't go beyond the authority they've been given by God either, just as an aside. So this is delegated leadership. This isn't autonomous, but only... No more, no less authority, no more, no less responsibility than God has actually ordained. The second event that we want to see from Saul's life is in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel. So fast forward a little bit, and we find ourselves at Samuel's, or excuse me, in 1 Samuel 13 at Saul's sacrifice, event number two, Saul's sacrifice. Samuel has sent him ahead. He's supposed to be waiting for Samuel to arrive. And look at verse 8 in 1 Samuel 13. So he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring near to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. So here, in a way forbidden to kings, he's going to also function as priest. The dual role of king and priest has been reserved for one descendant of David, has been reserved for one king of Israel forever. No king was supposed to function also as priest, and no priest was also supposed to function as king. Here, Saul is going to overstep his authority. He's scared of authority on one hand, and then here, he's taking more responsibility than he's been given by God, and he's going to offer the burnt offering. Look at verse 10. As soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. But Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come when, within the appointed days and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. Therefore, I said, notice all the reasons he has for his disobedience. Therefore, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not entreated the favor of Yahweh. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of Yahweh your God, which he commanded you. For now, Yahweh would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now 
Your kingdom shall not endure. Yahweh has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And Yahweh has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what Yahweh commanded you. Nothing in Saul's explanation of, I offered the burnt offering because I was a fool and impatient and did not trust the Lord and did not trust you, Samuel. None of that. Just excuses. Well, look at everything that I could see. The Philistines are ready for battle. You weren't here. The time, the days had run out. And I needed Yahweh's favor. So I went after getting God's favor by disobeying God. God's favor never comes that way. He should have known this. You cannot have God's favor apart from submission to his will. And yet this is how Saul goes after it. So what's the fear here? Well, this is actually a fear of man. This is a fear of man. Just notice what he says in verse 11. When he asked, what have you done? Because I saw that the people were scattering from me. Or excuse me, this is, a, the, this is one manifestation of a fear of man. We'll get to that next. Uh, this is a fear of loss. Here, the people are scattering from Saul. So he's losing people. This is people he would have needed to fight. People who are supposed to be uh, in the battle with him. Uh, people who would have been under his authority. And he has much less people than the Philistines. The Philistines assemble, according to verse 5, with 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen. Saul, according to verse 2, has 3,000 men total. And so he's looking for how to hold on to people. So he's afraid of losing them. This is the fear of loss. Uh, With this fear of loss, if he's losing soldiers who are going home because they're afraid or because they don't trust Saul, then this could have possibly meant the end of his own life in battle, could have meant the loss of loyalty, the loss of respect and honor that he had from these soldiers. And if they do lose the battle, then this could mean a loss of territory, a loss of land for him in the nation. So he's got lots of things to lose by losing these people. Here's some things he should have called to mind. He should have remembered Genesis 14, Abraham. Abraham had 318 men and defeated five kingdoms. Five kings gathered who had just won a war. And then when Abraham hears about them winning the war and taking his nephew captive, then he takes the 318 trained men who were born in his own household and he goes and defeats the five kings. That's a miraculous victory. And Abraham's old. That's not supposed to happen. Saul should have remembered Abraham. Saul should have also remembered Gideon who fought with 300 men and conquered 120,000 Midianites with those 300 men. He should have remembered Joshua, who always had less numbers than the surrounding Canaanite nations. And he certainly should have remembered the Exodus, that famous victory that God accomplished with no soldiers, no sword lifted. And he humbled an entire, the the entire nation of Egypt, the world power at the time. Saul should have remembered those things. You want to go home? Go. You won't be here to celebrate the victory. You won't be here to collect the spoil. God's on our side. We're going to trust him. This fear of loss made him distrust God. You just see the fear of loss in Saul's mind was greater than the fear that he should have had for the Lord. So he traded one for the other. He decided in a moment, I am more afraid of losing the people than I am of losing the kingdom given to me by God of dishonoring Yahweh's name in front of the nation and in front of the nations, the Philistines, even. He didn't fear that. He feared most of all losing the people. And so he made a great exchange on that day. And Saul tells him, because of this, he lost the kingdom. 
Just think about in your own life. Are there people you're afraid of losing? Is there honor, uh, a certain view of yourself that you're afraid of losing in front of a certain group of people? Is there prominence or a reputation that you have of some sort that you're too afraid to lose, that you're willing to disobey God, to hang on to it? Husbands, if in your mind, the most important thing to you is your wife's respect or having peace in your home that your wife can give or not, if you're most afraid of losing peace in your home, respect of your wife, at some point you're going to fail in your leadership because those hard things that you should say, the hard stances you should take, you're going to be unwilling to take them. You're going to be unwilling to say them because what looms largest in your mind is, what if she doesn't like me? Look, if she's godly, she's stuck with you. She's not going anywhere. Work through the hard issues. This is a, a lesson for wives, just as followers, as an aside. Don't try and be an imposing figure in your husband's life. Don't try and withhold what you can, uh, withhold peace or other things until your husband does what you want to do, because really that's you leading. That's overstepping the responsibilities you've been given by God. Influence him in every godly way that you possibly can. Speak the truth when you can, respectfully as you're able. Give wise counsel, and hopefully your husband is humble enough to look for it from you, to solicit your input. But you can entrust him to God, right? A third event from which we should learn about the impact of ungodly fear on leadership is Saul's disobedience. If we fast forward a couple chapters to chapter 15, Saul's disobedience here, and disobedience in particular when it comes to destroying the Amalekites. The Amalekites attacked Israel during the Exodus uh, after they had left Egypt. And so God, even after all these generations, has not forgotten that he will exact vengeance against them. And now he has a king and he is going to send that king on a mission to exact vengeance of or on the Mal Amalekites. Look at the instructions. Verse one, then Samuel said to Saul, Yahweh sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. So now obey the voice of the words of Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, infant and nursing baby, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. This is absolutely everything. Utter destruction. It's pretty simple. Don't leave anything alive. These are God's good, wise, just instructions to Saul. Notice in verse 7, so Saul struck the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt, and he seized Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. That sounds like a lot more than everything. And they were not willing to devote them to destruction, but everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. I want you to just notice what the chronicler, uh, the, the writer here, the biblical writer does when he records this event. He says, verse seven, Saul struck and he sees Agag alive. So in his mind, this biblical writer, it's clear, it's Saul. Verse 9, but Saul and the people 
Still Saul's at the front, at the head, but the people too participated in this disobedience. And notice that this was a matter of the will. This was a matter of the will, but they were not willing to devote them to destruction. Saul and the people weren't willing. It was a matter of the will. Jump down to verse 24. This is Saul's confession, finally. It takes 15 verses to get a confession out of him. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed trespassed against the command of Yahweh and your words because why? I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Here's what you should get from this. Fear is a matter of the will. Fear is a matter of the will. If you know the truth, then you can choose to not be afraid. Contrary to what our culture would like to say, that fear is a matter of your biology, fear is a matter of your brain, fear is a natural response to your neurons firing in your brain, and what can fix it is a pill. That's not the biblical perspective. Fear is a matter of the will. Saul wasn't willing to devote the things, and yes, he feared the people. Because of what he was afraid the people would think of him, man, these are really good animals. That's a lot of beef for the next however long. Don't devote it to destruction. What will they think if I tell them they have to slaughter it and burn it and leave it? They'll hate me. And so he chooses rather to lay hold of that fear and put off a fear of God. That's a choice. He made an exchange willingly. He traded a fear of God, said, you can have that. I'll let go of that so I can hang on to this fear of man. And that's what this passage, that's the fear that this passage just so clearly puts in front of us. He's afraid, he is a man who is afraid of responsibility. He is a man who is afraid of loss. And he is a man who is afraid of other men. He is afraid of people. And as we read in Proverbs 29, this laid a snare for him. It just prepared for him to be caught, to enter into further trouble. That's a lesson all its own. If you fear man, you are welcoming trouble into your life. So just think, whatever you're afraid of in that fear of man, just reason with your own soul. Is this worth whatever unknown trouble I'm welcoming? And the answer is no. Is this worth whatever discipline from the Lord is going to come, perhaps, as a result of fearing man? No. Is this worth the pangs of conscience and guilt I might experience from caving to the fear of man? No, it is not. All of those things are other troubles you welcome into your life when you're finally caught in that snare that the fear of man laid for you. This fear, the fear of man, perpetuates other sins. And we see that even in this passage. This fear of man that Saul was bound to, captured by, perpetuated moral blindness and or an unwillingness to confess sin. Just notice in verse 13, how when Samuel confronts him, He says, blessed are you of Yahweh to Samuel. I have established the word of Yahweh. No, you haven't. You haven't established the word of Yahweh. God already has told Samuel, he has not established my words, verse 11. God's already told Samuel the truth before you even came back. Like, don't try and lie to a prophet. (laughs) This is what he's doing. So he's morally blind to his own sin, or he's simply unwilling to confess it. The same thing is true in verse 15. And Saul said, they have brought 
They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to Yahweh your God, but the rest we have devoted to destruction. Still, this is blame shifting. We did do what God said to do. No, you didn't. Verse 20, same thing. I did obey the voice of Yahweh and went on the way on which Yahweh sent me and have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. We st- st- nope, still not there yet. You know, that happens in counseling at times. You're trying to put your finger on an issue. You're bringing it to someone's attention and they're like denying it. Okay, well, you're not letting up. I, I, I am guilty of this, but still not this. Nope, we need to get all the way here. That's what's happening. Samuel's confronting, Samuel's pushing. He's reluctant until finally in verse 24, he just says, okay, I have sinned. I have trespassed. Because you feared man, you feared the people. He also was blame shifting. Go back to verse 15. They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen. He's still blaming the people. You're the king. You're supposed to be telling them what to do. Verse 21, but the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choices of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to Yahweh, your God at Gilgal. If you're leading, just own it. When things don't go right, just own it. Of course, other people are involved. Other people are almost always involved. That's not the point. You're leading. So take responsibility and just say, you know what? Doesn't matter who else under my leadership erred. I'm the leader. That's on me. Dads, do that. Your wife's struggling at home. Children aren't obeying, out of control, whatever. That falls on you. It's your responsibility. Of course you weren't home all day. Doesn't matter. It's still your responsibility to oversee the activity and get things in order. Doesn't mean that everybody else is sinless. It just means in taking responsibility that you're eager to own it. Just notice this fear of man, this fear of the, the people perpetuated the same thing. More fear of man. Is, is Saul finally humbled in verse 24? Look at verse 25. So now, Please forgive my sin and return with me that I may worship Yahweh. Is he finally humbled? Wow, he wants to worship God. He's asking Samuel to return with him and offer this sacrifice. Well, Samuel refuses, but just notice what's underneath that request for Samuel to come back so he can worship Yahweh with Samuel. Look at verse 30. Here's what's beneath even that request. More fear of man. I have sinned, but please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may worship Yahweh, your God, not my God, your God. It's clear. I don't really love God. I don't really fear him. In this back and forth, Samuel, you've made that abundantly evident, but would you still just come back with me? And just honor me in front of the people. I'm not honorable, but honor me anyway, because everybody else is standing around. That's still a fear of man. Because what's looming largest in his mind is not what does God think about me in this moment? It's what do the people think of me? What do the elders think of me? If Samuel, if you don't come back with me, then what? What are they going to, how are they going to look at me? You got to come back. Still enslaved to a fear of man. And so he's a poor leader. Again, Hezekiah provides a, a good contrast. He does not fear the people, doesn't fear the, the old men who followed his father. He starts overturning things and he says, this is the way we're going. What if it just means, I mean, what if the worst possible thing could happen from you submitting to God in your leadership? The worst possible thing that could happen to you is you die and then you go be with Jesus for eternity. It's not that bad, right? Sometimes it's just helpful when you find yourself being anxious or fearful about something, just say, okay, heart, just just reason with your own soul and say, what if you're worried about all the what ifs? Well, let me just answer the questions. What if? 
What if that person doesn't respond the way I want them to? What if they don't want to be my friend anymore? What if they don't want to, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. What if I lose my job? What if I die? Well, it's not so bad if you're a Christian. <laughs> Just trace your, your anxieties out to their logical end and then tell yourself, it's foolish to be anxious about these things. Lastly, the, the fourth event is Saul's fight. And that's in chapter 17. Saul's fight in 1 Samuel 17. If you know 1 Samuel 17, I mean, in your Bible, maybe the, the title is David and Goliath. So you're thinking, isn't that David's fight? No, it wasn't supposed to be. Look at verse one. Now the Philistines gathered their camps for battle and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. And they camped between Soko and Azekah and Ephes Damim. But Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and arranged themselves for battle to meet the Philistines. Now the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. Huge open space, two mountains, easy to see across all of it. We, we got to be there just at our trip earlier this year in Israel. Great place for battle, wide open. You can see all the moves that the other army is making as they're approaching. Verse four, then a champion came out from the camps of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span about nine feet, and he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, and the weight of that scale armor was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders, and the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. I mean, this, all the details are here to impress us with the size of this man. This, in all likelihood, would have been the tallest, biggest Philistine in the Philistine nation. So who better to fight him than the tallest man in Israel? All right, Saul, we're looking around. I mean, it's like you match a matchup on, on a basketball team. He's the tallest guy. Who's our tallest guy? You stick him. Saul, this is your moment. Isn't this why they made you king? Isn't this why they said they wanted a king to judge us and fight our battles? Great, you're the obvious choice. Look at verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Saul and all Israel. Not a man there to fight is willing to fight because why? They're all afraid. This is a, a fear, an, another perhaps manifestation of a fear of man, just the, the stature of a man but it's a fear of intimidation as well. A fear of intimidation. Things that are frightening, you're afraid of. This is just not to characterize the Christian. Not, not even, not Christian women. Because what does Peter say in 1 Peter 3.6? Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, you have become her children if you do good, not fearing any intimidation or not fearing anything that is frightful, frightening, fearful. Things that are fearful, are frightening, don't be afraid of them. If this is God's command to Christian women, how much more should it be the case for Christian men? Don't be afraid. You might lose that fight <laughs> if you're called to it. 
you might lose that battle. That thing, a decision you have to make, maybe some uncertain future where frightening things are possible, what does God say to us? Don't fear them. Goliath certainly would have been frightening, but we know that, again, this comes down to a matter of the will. Why? Because David actually goes and fights him and wins. Saul had nothing to be afraid of. He should have been afraid of lacking a fear of God. This whole story, by the way, hinges on one man's regard for God's glory. David is appalled that this uncircumcised Philistine would dare defy Yahweh of hosts. And so because he loves God and refuses to let God's name be dishonored in this way among the nations, he goes and fights him. A child, a teenager, over the king of Israel. Just a, a, few, a few words about conquering these various manifestations of fear that impact negatively so leadership. Let me just give them to you. First off, flee the wrath to come. Psalm 46 describes great wrath coming, and those psalmists say, we will not fear. Why? Because God is our refuge. If you have made God your refuge and you have fled to Christ for refuge from the coming wrath, you have nothing else to fear. There is nothing more frightful than the day of tribulation coming on this world when Jesus unleashes his wrath. If you know him, then you are safe in him as a fortress, as it were, from the worst that, that this world will ever experience. You have nothing else, which all falls into the category of lesser dangers. You have nothing else to fear, Christian. So the first way to escape ungodly fear, to be freed from it, is to believe Christ. If you're enslaved to your anxieties, if you're en enslaved to fear, believe Christ. That's the first matter of importance to be rescued, to conquer ungodly fear. And the second is similar, fear God. The one who fears God has nothing else to fear. I mentioned John Flavel's work on keeping the heart. Here's what he says when he urges in that section on fear. Here's his instructions for how to conquer the fear of man. Consider this. He says, quote, do every big word and proud dust, does every big word of proud dust make thee afraid? Doth the voice of a man make thee tremble and shall not the voice of God? If thou art of such a fearful and timorous spirit, how is it that thou fearest not to obey, disobey the flat commands of Jesus Christ? Methinks the command of Christ should have as much power to calm as the voice of a poor worm to terrify thy heart. We cannot fear creatures sinfully till we have forgotten God. Did we remember what he is and what he hath said? We should not be of such feeble spirits. Bring thy heart then to this dilemma in times of danger." If I let into my heart the slavish fear of man, I must let out the reverential awe and fear of God. And dare I cast off the fear of the Almighty for the frowns of a man? Shall I lift up proud dust above the great God? Shall I run upon a certain sin to shun a probable danger? Oh, keep thy heart by this consideration. The fear of God casts out all other fears. The last bit of counsel just to take from this to get rid of the ungodly fear is to cast off the fear of death. Think about death and think about eternity. So what? We will for a moment suffer in this life and then we will enter into eternal bliss forever with our Lord 
And so any amount of pain, suffering, or danger in this life, even God. For the saints at Grace Bible Church, that you would make us a bold, humble people, uh, bold because we're humble, and humbly submit to your word, to your character, that it would embolden our gospel proclamations, that it would embolden our good obedience to you, that it would even embolden our leaderships, wherever we find ourselves uh, leading others in the home, at work, in the church. I pray that we would have clarity and that we would boldly step forward in obedience to you so that you get all the glory from us, from this church, and that your name is honored and that your truth is upheld. And we ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.